thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Looks like we have a good crowd on the call. My name's Lauren Broyce. I work at Sustainable Westchester, and I'm the director of the Energy Smart Homes program. And tonight we're going to be hearing from a whole bunch of speakers that will be sharing a wealth of information with you. And I think I uh, just want to say, not to repeat everything that's going to happen because you'll hear it from the speakers, but we want to say thanks for joining and we're glad to see you here. And if you have questions after the webinar, we're always available. I'll drop my email and the phone number in the chat. So with us tonight, we're joined by um, a partnership between the municipalities of the village of Ossining, the town of Ossining, and the village of Briarcliff. Also, Green Austining and the Briar Cove Sustainability Committee have all come together to bring the Energy Smart Homes programs to our community. They work together to apply to have this program with Sustainable Westchester, and our funding for this program comes from NYSERDA. So that's a little bit of the background information. I think without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Dana Levenberg. She is the supervisor of the town of Austining. Thank you so much, Lauren, and big thanks and big shout out to Sustainable Westchester as well as to NYSERDA for helping us bring these um, options to our community and bringing energy smart homes to our communities of uh, Village of Austin, Briarcliff, and Town of Austin. Uh, I also want to give a big shout out to our volunteer organizations because without them, we wouldn't be here tonight. And that, of course, is Susie Ross and all of the great folks who volunteer for Green Austin, as well as our sustainability committee. Um, and I'm sorry, sustainable Briarcliff. So thank you because without the volunteers, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have organized uh, a plan for how we can reach out into our community to actually talk about how residents can reduce their um, energy usage and also uh, tap into rebates and incentives to implement energy saving measures in their homes, like insulation, clean heating, and cooling. And together, these measures will help us uh, reduce our, reach our climate goals, reduce uh, fossil fuel, dependence, and hopefully increase the comfort and efficiencies in your homes and, and maybe save you some money down the line. We're really working hard to get the word out to our community about all of the benefits of changing your heating and cooling systems and also energizing your home and reducing um, where you can, uh, adding all sorts of benefits. And then also, um, we're this is just part of some of the good work that we've been doing in the town and, and the villages, which includes um, in introducing electric vehicle charging stations, changing uh, over to adding electric vehicles to our municipal fleets, uh, introducing food scrap recycling program. And if you don't know about that, you should. Um, it's available at Cedar Lane Park in Austin every day to all of the people in the villages of Austin and Briarcliff in the town, as well as introducing community choice aggregation for um, at 100% green electric uh, supply through, again, our partnership with Sustainable Westchester. And Sustainable Westchester has really been a godsend in terms of helping us to um, move closer to our climate goals, but we have a lot of work to do to reduce carbon emissions. And we know that we can only do that with partnerships with our residents because so much of our energy use um, comes from our homes as well as our businesses. So thanks again to Sustainable Westchester for being such great partners and thanks to my colleagues in the villages of Austin and Briarcliff. Thanks, Dana. Okay, and now we're going to hear some words from Rika Levin. She is the mayor of the village of Austining. Oh, you're muted. Okay, that's one. Every time someone's muted, we get a prize. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that as a subtle hint by my computer. Um, so welcome, glad to see some familiar faces. I'm gonna make it short and sweet. Sweet, I have been a mayor for about three weeks, but a trustee for a number of years before that and a village resident for a long time. 
So what I know to be true is that Green Austining has done an amazing job of educating the community about opportunities, technologies, sustainable Westchester has been a phenomenal partner. It's just easier for me to say, I always go after Dana, after the supervisor, and it's just easier for me to say ditto to literally everything she said. Uh, what I do want to say though, when you leave here tonight, A, I hope that you walk away with some new golden nugget that you, most of you are in your homes, I think, walk around your home and say, this is what I'm gonna do. This is sort of my next step. After that, that you call two or three friends, I would ask you to call two or three friends, neighbors, colleagues and say, look, I just heard about a great idea. I really wanna encourage you to do that. Uh, the village of Austin has 26,000 residents plus. If half of them would be more educated about the amazing work being done in this community about how to improve their homes and improve the environment for their children going forward, we would just be in such a much better place. So uh, no need to hear from me. I'm not one of the experts speaking tonight. I'm one of the benefactors of um, a number of programs from uh, having all electric cars in my home, solar panels when my husband met Susie Ross, I think seven years ago, five years ago. I think that's when he may have met Dana. So I am a benefactor of this information. I'm here to learn a lot along with the rest of you tonight. So please take me up on my challenge. And now we're going to let some of the experts speak. Thank you all. Perfect. Thanks, Rika. All right. And we're going to hear now from Donovan Gordon, the Director of Clean Heating and Cooling at NYSERDA. Well, thank you very much, Lauren. And, and I have to say, um, it is tough following Dana and Rika. I mean, you know, and, and, and I was, and I'm usually love speaking. Uh, Scott Smith on the phone knows that, that I do. Uh, but I am so pleased to, to see the support that Sustainable Westchester is getting from the elected officials. And that Rika herself is a, is, is not, she's a benefactor. No, she, she's an evangelist. She's using it. She's electric cars and solar. So uh, the residents who are participating tonight, I think you're in for a treat. And, and I have to, I must say uh, that coming from NYSERDA, as, as uh, Lauren mentioned, we are supporting this effort uh, financially. We're given uh, we gave a grant to, to be able to do this. And I could not be more pleased with the investment that we're making uh, uh, through Sustainable Westchester and the work that they're doing, the work that they have been doing and will continue to do. So um, we have a very aggressive carbon reduction goals. Uh, we really need to uh, convert our uh, buildings, our homes uh, uh, off of fossil fuels. Uh, if we wanted to uh, reach our carbon reduction goals. Uh, just so you know, this is a point of fact, uh, about a third, almost 33% of the carbon emissions in New York State comes from buildings. Uh, another 40 or so percent comes from vehicles. So over 70% of the carbon emissions in New York State comes from transportation and buildings. So we need more heat pumps in buildings and homes and electric vehicles. Uh, so with that, I will say again, thank you for having us, having me speak. Uh, thank you for the work that you do, Lauren, and, and the rest of Sustainable Westchester. And I look forward to a wonderful campaign in uh, Austin and Brightcliffe. Thanks, Donovan. Yeah. Can I butt in for one very quick yeah. second? I wanted, to, I just happened to see that our Honorable Sue Donnelly is on this um, uh, list of participants and she was instrumental in bringing Energize and Solarize to Austin, again, in collaboration with uh, Sustainable Westchester and especially with Green Austin. And I have to give her a big shout out because she really laid the foundation for us doing all this work in Austin and Briarcliff and partnering. And um, so I'm glad to see her on this. And that's probably why I have We've energized, we've re-insulated, we've added solar panels, we've bought an electric car, all those good things too. And again, couldn't have done it without, without you, Sue, so thank you. That's right, thank you, Sue. Okay, and Scott's on the line too, Scott Smith from NYSERDA as well. Scott, did you wanna say anything or can we go on to our homeowner testimonial? Yeah, there's not much I can add to what Donovan already said. So thank you very much for everyone for being here. Appreciate it. 
Thanks. Okay, so before we move into sharing our screen and having all the little boxes go away, I love seeing everybody's little boxes because I feel so lonely in my house all the time, so it's nice to get together. We're going to hear a homeowner testimonial from Katie Alberti. She has taken efforts to um, make her house more energy efficient and also just recently switched to geothermal energy. So she's going to share a little bit of her story. Hi. Um I'm Katie Alberti. My husband is John Bell. We uh, live at 47 Lee Avenue, which is in the village, right actually right on the edge of the, ta the town too. Our house was built in, um, it's a 1958 Cape Cod wood frame, about 1,200 square feet. Nothing, e nothing exciting whatsoever. We have an unfinished basement and a half story, a finished attic. We bought the house in 1992 when we moved here. And when we moved in, it had a very old gas furnace, forest air heating, no central air. And we lived with that until it died and replaced it with a high efficiency unit in 1992 and added central air conditioning. And we thought we were doing something wonderful because it was a, a condensing uh, high efficiency gas furnace. Gas was great. Well, it's not. Gas, we all know how gas works. You burn it and it heats you up, um, but it also releases carbon. So we held on to that for a very long time, even though we both knew, my husband and I, that eventually we'd have to find a way not to burn gas and create carbon. So we're both somewhat procrastinators. And over time, we knew we needed, we had the goal of getting to energy efficiency and comfort. The house had minimal, minimal uh, insulation. It had a lot of aluminum sliding triple track windows. The house was extremely drafty. We lived with it for a while. We did some window replacements, even though that's not the key to energy efficiency, but it looked good and I could go to bed without wearing mittens. In 2016, uh, we finally had an energy efficiency audit. And I really recommend if you're thinking of doing any, any uh, improvements to your house, start from that point. There's no point in buying more furnace than you need, no point in buying more solar panels than you need. Get your house airtight, get it as insulated as you can, and you'll see a huge difference right away. It was hard to see our energy reduction at that point because 2016 was also the year I retired. So our house was now occupied 24 hours a day as opposed to 12 hours a day. So it was really hard to see the energy change, but it, you could feel the, feel the comfort level change and really improve. And by the way, I heard about, we did this through one of the NYSERDA programs and I believe it was, it, seed was planted in my mind initially through one of um, Ossining's, Green Ossining's initiatives and Sustainable West Chester initiative. We didn't sign up within that window, but I had all the materials and eventually I made the decision and it was done with the, um, program that had that paid the energy auditing contractor to do the audit for us and then we got some tax breaks from that so we were happy with that and we lived with that for a while procrastinating on the rest of the um the rest of the improvements until one night when we turned on our air conditioner for the first time i think it was last summer summer before last it's all blending together our um outside units started making loud screeching noises and we learned that it needed to be replaced. And just replacing that part of the whole system would have been about $4,000. And I could not in good conscience continue with a, a gas eating system. So we started thinking about geothermal. And I had heard of it before. Um, we had friends who had it installed, but at the time, it, the impression was it was kind of a crunchy granola thing. One friend had actually dug his own geothermal loop and another one had, you know, something very exotic put in. So it was sort of at the back of my mind as something that maybe normal people don't go into. However, I also had friends who lived in Bedford and heard about Bedford's program similar to this last year, two years ago, and picked up some of the brochures. And um, after my 
after we heard about how much it would cost to start replacing parts of our current heating air conditioning system, I called Dandelion and started the process. It took a very long time because of COVID. Um, they were backed up. They were very, very good about telling us what we would be getting ourselves into and um, walking us step by step through the process. It had multiple, there's multiple pieces. You have a, and I'm sure when they do their presentation, they'll tell you how it goes. What we have is a single um, loop well in the backyard and then a trench that comes to the house into the basement right next to our washing machine up and around and uh, the high efficiency heat pump inside the house with both heats and cools. Um, and it's, we had it turned on on Tuesday and it's great. It really is great. It's, you have to get a little bit used to it. It does, the advice we got from the installer was do not try to turn it up and down and up and down um, because it's tapping into the thermal properties of the earth. It's not gonna change suddenly. So I'm really happy we made the decision and um, I think you'll hear a little bit more about it. And uh, it took me a while to get here, but here we are. Oh, by the way, we only wound up paying about 43% of the total cost of this system because the bulk of the, the rest of it, over 50% was, was paid for from um, incentives, rebates, and tax credits. Not bad. 43%. Yep. Pretty cool. Well, thanks, Katie, for sharing the journey. And I think for a lot of homeowners, it is a long process of deciding what you want to do, where are your priorities, committing, and then going forward. So it's nice to hear how you guys have done it over the years. So um, if there's any questions for Katie, let's hold them for the end. We are going to transition to another speaker. Susie is going to speak next, and we're going to share some slides. But before that, just want to give you a little teaser. Um, after we have our presentation, the contractors are all here. So we have Jason from Energy Management Solutions, Lexi from Healthy Home, Rob from Geothermal Works, and Corey from Dandelion, all here to answer any of the specific questions that you have about the technologies and um, energy savings. So let's see what we have here. Oh, and what did I say? Yeah, and there's also options for renters. We're going to touch on that as well. So I'm going to share my screen. And if there's any questions, please drop them in the chat as they're coming to you. And we will move through them at the end of the presentation. So you can see the screen. Yep, good. Okay, so briefly, I just want to mention, if you're unfamiliar with Sustainable Westchester, we are a nonprofit organization that um, is basically a consortium of Westchester County local governments facilitating effective collaboration, resulting in sustainability initiatives and cutting edge innovation. So the majority of Westchester County municipalities are members of Sustainable Westchester. And not only do we have programs like Energy Smart Homes, but as hinted at in the poll when we first got started on the call, there's other programs available that can help you to lower your energy bills and lower your carbon footprint. So we won't spend too much time talking about them tonight because even just energy smart homes can be a lot, but if you have any questions about sustainability, please contact us. And okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is Susie is go, oh, actually one more thing. So you might've noticed on the advertisements for each person on the call, we're going to have a tree planted through one tree planted. And this webinar is supporting the tree plantings in the US um, Forest Service. So if you filled out the registration for the event, you will have a tree planted in your honor. And if you haven't done the RSVP yet, or if you're watching on Facebook, Hamza is gonna drop in a link to the RSVP um, form and you fill that out and then you'll have the tree planted in your honor. So that's there. And now, Susie, are you ready to talk about Cure 100 and Austining 100? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Um, before I get started, I, I, um, I do also want to thank um, my Briarcliff cohort members uh, from Briarcliff Sustainability. 
This is the first time we've really had an opportunity to work uh, with another group within Briarcliff Manor. So I'm really happy uh, Padma and Jen are on the call, I believe. And, um, and they've been great on really wanting to um, get Briarcliff um, involved um, in a different way. We worked um, with Briarcliff on the Solar Eyes campaign with Sustainable Westchester, but, um, but I'm really happy to have them. Uh, so uh, thanks both of you for the work you're doing there. And thanks uh, to Vinny who's been working with us uh, from the village of Briarcliff Manor. Um, so be, on behalf of Green Austining, uh, we're really excited to be bringing uh, the community a tool. Um, this is my opportunity to talk about something that's actually uh, dovetailing into the launch of this event. Um, it's a solution that really speaks to you and your household's personal carbon emissions. I'm only going to be speaking briefly about it here tonight, but it's such a compliment to the Energy Smart Homes program that we decided to unveil access to it and announce uh, the launch of our chapter beginning this evening. So before I dive into the nuts and bolts of this free tool that we're making available to the greater Austin community, I want to quickly explain some of the acronyms. Um, it's a lot to talk about. Um, so I'm going to try to get that out of the way quickly and just uh, really what I'm going to do is kind of show you some carbon emission information that will hopefully get you excited about using this tool. Um, so Austining 100 is a chapter which consists of a team of Green Austining members that's dedicated to educating and showing our community how to reduce carbon emissions through high impact actions. Can you advance? Oh, yeah. Thanks. I'm gonna be a good slide clicker tonight. Thank you so much. <laughs> so the Austining 100 chapter is one of a growing number of chapters in a consortium called CURE 100, um, or unfurling that acronym, uh, the C-U-R-E stands for Communities United to Reduce Emissions by 100%. And this concept of CURE 100 was created by our really smart friends in Croton whose mission through the Croton 100 chapter is to advocate, educate, um, and, um, and create campaigns that get community members to better understand their own personal carbon footprint and offer choices that empower them to make informed changes to reduce their carbon emissions through this Cure 100 carbon tracker. And that's really kind of the fun thing, and we'll get to that in a moment. So in addition to launching our chapter of Cure 100, we're also launching the Cure 100 Carbon Tracker app uh, for use by residents for the town of Austining and both the villages of Austining and Briarcliff Manor. Um, okay, stay on that slide. The importance of launching uh, the Carbon Tracker app now is really because the time is right. Um, aside from this week's flurry of Biden administration executive orders um, recognizing and supporting uh, climate change science, um, which is a new thing um, in the past four years. The UN's International Panel on Climate Change warned in 2018 that we needed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius to make our adaptation to a warming planet less difficult. And the main driver of our warming planet really comes from human caused uh, use of fossil fuels. Uh, secondly, in 2019, New York State passed what's perhaps the most aggressive climate legislation in the country with the passing of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. And that calls for a cut in carbon emissions by 40% by 2030 and net zero by 2040, as well as a move uh, to 100% carbon-free electricity by 2040. Um, and lastly, with the launch of Energy Smart Homes here tonight, we're excited to be working on a third major program collaboration uh, with Sustainable Westchester that will once again uh, focus on reducing our fossil fuel usage. Next slide, please. So the, the goal of Austining 100 is, is, is extremely simple. We seek to reduce our emissions as a community um, from its baseline amount in 2020 to zero by 2040, in keeping with the urging of the United Nations. So we will reduce by 5% a year until we get to zero by 2040. In other words, we'll take 20 steps down to the carbon, down the carbon ladder until we actually achieve that net zero by 2040. 
So this is all about carbon reduction. We're laser focused on reducing our carbon. You can go to the next one. Okay. Um, so with the help of this carbon tracker, uh, we can quantify community-wide emissions, emissions by household, individual emissions, emissions by sectors or pillars such as transportation and heating. Donovan had mentioned those are the two largest carbon emitters in, um, in you know, in, and I think based, it's in, the, in New York State, but it probably is pretty typical across the United States, and carbon reductions as well. The tracker does provide quantified directional guidance for step down. So, you know, whatever you're going to see, you'll see suggestions about how to reduce your carbon uh, footprint. Um, so here's where you go. I'll put the, the location in the chat in a moment. Um, there's a couple things I'll follow up with in the chat in a moment. You can go to the next slide, Lauren. So if you go to the Green Austining website, greenaustining.org, um, you'll see the carbon tracker in the menu bar. And before you get started, you'll be given some information about things you'll want to have in hand so you can set up this personal profile. And all in all, it should probably take no more than about 45 minutes. Um, next slide, please. Once you get to... Um, in your profile, you're going to be asked a series of very simple questions and you'll get a series of prompts and that uh, that are pretty user friendly and should um, really be uh, relatively easy to answer once you have the information on hand. And uh, next slide, please. And once completed, you'll get an overview of your carbon footprint that may look a little like this. Um, and it shows the various sectors that I mentioned and how that compares to others. Thank you. Once completed, you'll also get this overview of your carbon footprint um, that shows the information by that individual sector and also the suggested step down. So as you'll see here, um, there's guidance on, on, you know, things that may cost a little bit more, less, you know, so there's a variety of different ways. But again, it's incredibly educational and very informative. So following is, is really like a high level view that gives you the types of information that the carbon tracker may offer to an average individual. So you can better understand the, subject, the suggested step downs from a quantifiable perspective. And as you can see here, for example, this is what, um, this is what it would look like uh, for an average person who uses um, a school bus. And again, these are, these are these are the types of, of information you'll be asked in your profile. So when you're setting it up, it'll ask if you if you have kids and if they ride the school bus, because again, fossil, there's a whole movement to move school buses to um, electric school buses. Um, and uh, obviously things like SUVs, uh, gas powered SUVs are, are going to be uh, very impactful to your carbon footprint. So again, uh, it'll offer suggestions such as stepping down, you know, in, in transportation options. Uh, looking at electricity, the next one, thank you, Lauren. Um, again, you know, the electricity choices you make have a tremendous impact as you, as you can see, you can go to the next one. I'm gonna really go through these pretty quickly because we are going to, and I'll, I'll mention at the end, offer uh, a Monday night, actually, we are having an open house on these. Um, uh, on the whole tracker and how to actually walk through it. So again, uh, your waste, the waste, uh, whether you recycle airline flights, which I think is probably going to be a big win for most of us this year, and uh, looking at your diet and food choices again, um, have a very large impact. And finally, let's talk about that heating one. Here we go. So, um, you know, oil is the least efficient way of heating your home and the average home has nearly about six tons of carbon impact from, from an oil furnace. Uh, natural gas does burn cleaner, but there is a leakage effect that pretty much nullifies the environmental benefit to natural gas. So stepping down to heat pumps, which we'll learn more about tonight, actually reduces uh, emissions tremendously. And I wanted to give you just a very quick overview of the Greater Austin community and its carbon, uh, its carbon equivalents um, annually. 
This information includes the town of Austin and the village of Briarcliff Manor, Manor and the village of Austin and combined. Next slide, please. Thank you. So as you can see, transportation, as mentioned earlier, is the single, single largest driver of, of carbon emissions followed by heating. Uh, the next slide will give you a better look at um, the breakdowns of them. And so you can see that um, the big hitters are transportation and um, heating and electricity usage. So there's the big hitters that really you can take care of by making these major shifts and then there's day-to-day -day actions that you can take that will also reduce your carbon emissions. If you go to the next slide please, this is um, you know looking at our villages you can see that gas and fuel usage there's a lot going on in this chart but the point was really to show you um, CO2 equivalents, gas usage, gas usage and fuel usage compared to both Westchester and the total U.S. And the intent of the chart really it's it really is to show not who is worse and who may be better, um, but should show really that we all have a lot of work to do. And the intention is really to hopefully get you curious about determining where you may fall using the carbon tracker. So I'm gonna leave you with this last point on this last slide, thank you, whoops. And that is um, by 2050, uh, various estimates suggest that our ambition should be to shrink our personal carbon footprint to 1.5, from one to 1.5 tons annually. And the current global figure estimate has us at seven tons. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of work we need to do, um, but I do believe that this tool will help us get um, into making better choices about, um, you know, working towards uh, living in a more sustainable future. Um, the last slide, if you will, so very quickly, I just wanted to introduce you to, Mary's upside down or sideways there, I don't know why, um, but this is the team uh, that is working behind uh, the Austin 100 chapter, Dorian Burden, Dhruv Gupta, Mary Null, uh, and Ganelle Rydstrom. I think they're all on the call this evening. And you can meet us all uh, while we walk you through actually the carbon tracker and a little bit more detail behind it on Monday night, February 1st, from 6.30 to 7.30. Um, we will have a link available at greenaustining.org, but I will put uh, both the carbon tracker link and the link to our open house um, in the chat momentarily. So I wanted to thank you all for coming this evening and being curious and interested enough to, you know, whether it's about saving money or whether it's about doing the right thing by the environment. Um, thank you for investing in our future. Thanks, Susie. Hopefully everybody found that data so interesting. I loved how um, the carbon tracker allows us to see the Briarcliff data, the Austining data, really cool tool. And I'm looking forward to Monday. That's this Monday, right? It's already February. Gosh. It's just Monday, okay. February. Right. Crazy. Okay, so now we're gonna move into some specifics. Ajay from Cadmus is going to be walking us through these slides and we're gonna move through four different technologies that people might find useful through the Energy Smart Homes program. Yeah, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Um, and yeah, let's talk about uh, some specific technologies that uh, you can put into your house. Um, so I'll echo um, what Devin was saying that uh, about a third of New York's greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. Um, and that for a typical New York home, three quarters almost of their energy bill is for heating and cooling. Uh, and because very often that heating system is gas or oil, um, the path to reducing carbon emissions is to electrify everything you can. Uh, and this is where um, clean heating and cooling initiatives uh, come in. Uh, so um, Energy Smart Homes in Westchester County is one of many such programs um, at this point. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work going across the state into um, getting heat pumps into people's houses. Yeah, and we show this slide so if anybody has a house in another part of the state or a good friend or a relative, they can also tap into similar rebates and incentives all across New York State. It is really exciting. Um, and that brings us to Energy Smart Homes. Um, which uh, is looking to uh, help all of you uh, get uh, heat pumps uh, and energy efficiency measures into your houses. 
um, one to displace fossil fuels, one to respond to uh, recent gas constraints in the county, uh, in the hope of having you help having helping you all uh, lower your home energy bills and increase home comfort because uh, heat pumps are really nice. That's like outside of all of the uh, energy efficiency stuff, they're just nice. <laughs> <laughs> And I just want to point out that obviously tonight we're focused on residential applications, but if you are a building owner, property manager, we do have um, Rachel Carpatella as our director of commercial clean heating and cooling. So please get in touch with us if you have any questions for commercially owned properties. Definitely. Um, and that brings us to um, the four big technologies we'll go over tonight, um, starting with home energy efficiency, uh, then getting to air source heat pumps, then to ground source heat pumps or geothermal, as you might have heard it before, and then on to heat pump water heaters. So let's start with home energy efficiency. Um, we have our two home energy. Sorry, Ajay, I keep interrupting you. I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> all right, sorry. We have our two energy efficiency contractors on the line tonight, Jason and Lexi from the two companies listed here will be um, speaking and answering questions at the end. Wonderful. I'm really excited. Um, so home energy efficiency is, it's the classic, it's the perennial favorite. It is almost always um, a fantastic improvement to a house, um, regardless of what uh, heating and cooling system you have in your house. Um, so the first step of, you know, if you're looking into getting a heat pump, uh, heck, if you're looking to get solar panels even, um, look into getting an energy assessment of your house and seeing if you can improve your home's envelope. Stuff like insulating your attic, adding insulation to your walls, sealing up all the windows and doors. Um, you know, it's, it seems like very simple stuff, but it makes a huge difference um, just across the board. And uh, there are a lot of um, resources for helping you get that, make that happen. You know, you can look around for um, free reduced cost home energy assessments, a list of um, solid contractors, financing, um, quality assurance oversight by NYSERDA, home energy audits, and some pretty significant rebates as well. Uh, in particular, um, I want to uh, shout out the Assisted Home Performance Program with Energy Star. Uh, as well as Empower for uh, low and middle income uh, customers. Uh, Empower especially, you got a lot um, in terms of um, subsidized upgrades for everything from lighting to insulation to replacing old refrigerators to heat pumps, which brings us to heat pumps. <laughs> um, heat pumps are, uh, there's some real magical technology um, so most heating, heating systems, uh, heat homes the old fashioned way about burning things. Um, but, uh, I'll save the physics discussion. There's heat everywhere. And, um, with a heat pump, they can literally move that heat from, let's say the air outside of your house, to the air inside of your house. Um, air conditioners use the same technology, um, but heat pumps can go forward and backwards. So you can heat, you can move heat from the outside of your house to the inside or from the inside to the outside. Um, and to that end, this technology can um, work in a bunch of applications from air source heat pumps to ground source or geothermal heat pumps uh, to heat pump water heaters. And we'll talk about all of these. Uh, let's start with air source heat pumps. These are the, these are probably the, the most common source that is, in, the, the most common system that is installed um, in houses. Um, the basic principle is uh, it does everything an air conditioner can do, uh, plus uh, it can heat your house. Um, typically, you would have one unit that is on the outside of your house, roughly where uh, like an air conditioner unit would be. And then you have either a bunch of uh, ductless heads that are installed around the house, in zones, or you can have an air handler that plugs into whatever ducting you already have in your house. So the ductless systems, you might hear them called uh, mini splits. And then you might also hear about central air, air source heat pumps or um, ducted heat pumps. Um, modern systems now, you'll hear of cold climate air source heat pumps. These uh, work really, really well, even in uh, cold Northeast temperatures. Um, there was this old myth that heat pumps don't work in the north. That is wrong. They work fantastically here. Um, 
even in the dead of winter, these are twice as efficient as electric resistance heaters. And they're also more efficient than most air conditioners. So if you're in Katie's situation and you hear your old air conditioner go crunch, an air source heat pump will plug in pretty easily into whatever system you have. And it will allow you to heat your house as well. So look into that. Um, the big benefits are one, energy savings, um, because these things are quite efficient. Um, they're quiet, uh, they help with dehumidification, and they are extremely flexible. Um, whatever your house situation is, there is probably a heat pump situation that could work. Um, especially if you're looking at renovating part of your house or fixing a hot and cold spot in the house, or if you have an addition. So for example, in the basement that I'm in right now, this used to be an unfinished basement um, when I grew up here, uh, which means that all of the gas base boards up on the top floor aren't here. So what you wanted to do, what I could do if I wanted to be a little less cold in this room is install a single heat, ductless heat pump right on the wall next to me. And that would heat pretty much the entire basement. And it's a relatively simple installation. Um, you, only, you don't have to drill too many large holes in the wall. And, you know, if you already have ducts in your house, then you can just attach the heat pump system to the existing ducts. And the whole thing requires no combustion. Um, by the way, if you're looking at installing solar panels in your house, uh, look into sizing the solar panel for adding heat pumps to your house as well. Uh, are heat pumps right for your home? Probably um, because of the multiple um, options you have for how those heat pumps are installed in your house. In terms of cost, they start at about $4,000 for a single zone. Um, and in terms of rebates incentives, uh, Con Ed offers some pretty significant rebates um, for installing an air source heat pump. Think about $5,000 to $12,000 for a typical home in rebates. So next, let's get into ground source heat pump. This is what Katie has, and these are some quite fantastic systems. Uh, these follow the same principle as air source heat pumps, but instead of pulling air from, instead of pulling heat from outside air, it pulls heat from the ground, uh, which is a pretty constant temperature no matter what the weather is outside, which means, and we can go to the next slide, Oh yeah, I'm just going to point out that Rob and Corey from the Geothermal Works and Dandelion are on the line to answer the questions about geothermal after. But keep going, Ajay, you're doing Definitely. a great job. <laughs> um, so ground source heat pumps, um, these are pretty big installation projects uh, because what you have to do is to get to this reservoir of heat that's underneath your house, you have to drill wells to get to that reservoir. So it's a rather um, significant installation process, but once you have that, you have an incredibly efficient system that is easily three or four times more efficient than pretty much anything else on the market. Uh, and not only can it uh, provide whole home heating and coolant, it can also provide hot water if you size it right. Uh, in terms of benefits, once you have a, a geothermal heat pump system in your house, uh, that is some of the lowest operating costs for he heating and cooling that you can get. Um, it is a very um, clean whole home seat. It is a very clean whole home HVAC solution, and it is a very um, powerful way of just eliminating fossil fuel use from your house. Additionally, these things have a very very long system lifetime. The uh, indoor unit, which is what you're seeing on this image here, can last. 15 years, 20 years even, and the pipes underneath the house, those can last for even longer. And because none of the outdoor components are above ground, if your basement floods, all that piping will be fine, um, which improves um, resiliency for your house. And you get hot water heating if you ask for it. Um, Ground source heat pumps are um, best if you have existing ducts in your house, you have existing central AC. Um, honestly, oh. uh, Katie's situation is a pretty good example. Uh, if you already have um, the systems you want to replace, you're already looking into uh, insulating your house, doing all the home performance stuff, and then you are looking for a comprehensive heating and cooling system that handles 
every all the loads you would need for your house in one system. Uh, costs for these systems start at twenty thousand dollars, twenty five thousand dollars after incentives, um, and those incentives are quite significant, as Katie can attest to. Um, uh, also, I'll keep this in mind for both uh, air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. These costs are extremely flexible because there are a lot of options in terms of what kind of system you want, how you want the systems to be installed on the outside of your house. You know, if you want to move the outdoor units to a particular part of the house, if you want to add smart thermostats, if you wanted to add a bunch of um, home, home performance insulation on top of that, there is a lot of leeway in terms of how much you want to add to the system. Uh, and they all have their own relevant adders. Then, okay, sorry. But did you talk about the federal tax credit? Oh, right. And there is a quite significant federal tax credit that, um, that stacks on top of um, Con Ed's quite significant um, credits for installing a ground source heat pump. And then next, let's get into heat pump water heaters. Um, heat pump water heaters are, in terms of heat pump systems for your house, these are some of the easier ones to install. Um, because effectively, uh, a heat pump water heater, you might hear of these as hybrid electric heat pumps if you go to Home Depot. Um, think of them like regular electric water heaters with a little heat pump coil stacked on top, like a little hat. Um, so these are incredibly efficient, top of the line um, water heaters. They provide reliable hot water heat because even if the heat pump coil isn't working, you still have that electric backup. They reduce energy use quite a bit and you know, they're rel relatively inexpensive to operate once you have the system installed. Um, and Katie has one of these installed too. <laughs> they're quite nice. Um, so what these do is they use indoor, ear indoor air to heat your hot water. So if you have this in a basement, your basement will become a little colder and a little less humid, which is quite nice. And in return, you will get hot water. Um, in terms of, uh, let's go to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, if, is, if, whether heat pump water heaters are right for your home depends on where your water heater is um, because this system needs a little bit of air in the basement itself to pull heat from. And um, because of the, the heat pump coil on top, it's a little bit taller than regular heat pumps. So there needs to be the headroom for it. Um, typically the cost for these systems is about $2,500, $3,500. Um, but it's much more standardized because you can just stick this into your basement and it'll just work. Um, but common adders include electrical work, um, managing a, a condensate drain, and uh, a neat thing you can do is if you don't have enough space in your basement, you can add a vent system so that this heat pump will draw air from outside as opposed to from your basement. And Conet offers a pretty significant $1,000 per unit uh, uh, rebate for, say, a large-scale uh, water heater. Okay. We, get, we did it. Yeah, and, I'll, and uh, it's back to you, Lauren. Okay. So thanks, Ajay, for all the information. I'm sure people have more questions, and I'm seeing in the chat some others are saying that they have these systems in their home. Love to hear that, and we'd love to hear from you about it too. So if you're excited and you want to learn more or get involved or have a home energy assessment, the process is that tonight you can fill out the form. I'll drop the link in the chat to the sign-up form. Um, you fill that out and then pick a contractor. Give them a call to schedule your home energy assessment. Your contractor then can help you tap into the New York State rebates and utility incentives. And then with an upgrade, you'll have a cleaner, quieter, and more comfortable home. So we do realize that maybe even after this call, you might be feeling unsure about which contractor to call for the home energy assessment or the heat pump site visit. So feel free to give us a call at the Sustainable Westchester office and we can walk you through which contractor might be the best one for you to um, schedule that assessment with. So also just wanna mention, if you're a fan of repetition and you maybe wanna hear these things again or in a slightly different way, We'll be doing another Zoom event on February 4th. This one's for Pelham, but you could come to it. And there'll be another Austin and Briarcliff event on February 23rd at 6 p.m., a similar webinar to this. 
And the website has a lot of information, additional information about each of the technologies, case studies, testimonials, payback, all that information is there. So feel free to check it out. And uh, my contact info is here. I'll also put that in the chat box, but it looks like we are really on time and ahead of schedule. So I am going to just quickly mention the contractors that we have on the line, and then hopefully people feel comfortable either dropping their question in the chat or um, we have a, maybe a small enough group to have people unmute themselves and ask, ask questions. So we'll see how that goes. But basically, if you are looking for information about home energy efficiency, the two contractors for you to talk to are Energy Management Solutions and Healthy Home Energy and Consulting. If you're looking for air source heat pump, we've got three contractors that provide the air source heat pump. That's Healthy Home, Phoenix Mechanical, and Bell. And if you're looking to do the ground source heat pump, you have an option between three different contractors, Geothermal Works, Dandelion, and Bell. We do encourage people to get multiple assessments and to have um, multiple site visits. That's definitely something that um, I think homeowners look to do. Okay, so it looks like the first question that came in was from David. He wants to know, are these rebates available to condo owners? And the answer is yes, especially if you're a condo owner that has your own heating system in your house, you can tap into any of these programs. Perhaps geothermal might require some permission from your condo board, but it's, it's available to you. And Sue Donnelly is sharing a great story. She's got solar. Oh, she needs to get more panels. Does she go back to her Solarize contractor or another company? Uh, I think Solarize, your Ross Solar company might have merged with another company. So we would say, um, I'll, I'll put a link to the NYSERDA solar installers there. Okay. Thank um, you. Sure. Can someone provide a resource to locate a list of reliable, competent home energy audit contractors? Yes, so we've got two on the line and I should mention all the contractors on the call have responded to an RFP that Sustainable Westchester put out looking for contractors to get involved with this program. All the contractors on the list are certified with Con Ed and NYSERDA and they all are on our list, which is a reflection of being selected by the volunteer committees that you see tonight on the phone. So we had exhaustive and extensive contractor interviews where the committee of Green Austin and Briarcliff Sustainability picked these contractors. So while there are a lot out there, you've got the ones we recommend here on the call. Okay, oh yeah, okay. Any other questions, thoughts, comments, concerns? There's not too much activity in the chat, so if someone wants to unmute and ask the question, that, that would be fine. Can I just mention um, that wonderful presentation on from AJ on the- Yeah. Used the number of like 20, $24,000 after rebates and incentives. Ours after the rebates, incentives and uh, tax credit is going to be less than $18,000. Wow. I mean, excuse me, our geothermal system. But again, wow. house, one loop, a uh, four ton unit. Um, we did have to add a little bit of extra duct work, which is not included in that, which is how we wound up with the, uh, the um, heat pump water heater. And uh, it's, I won't go into the long story, but it, that's great too. It works just fine. I love it. So, all right, um, I'm gonna put that link to the contractor. So let's see, I have a question. There's no other questions out there. I could ask some questions. <laughs> okay, so let me ask a question to Lexi from Healthy Home. Lexi, what would you say are the most common problems that people have in their homes and some typical solutions that you guys have for home energy efficiency? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people call us just because their homes are drafty and uncomfortable. Wait, I can't. Lexi, you have And I mean, sometimes I have people show. who just moved into the house, and sometimes we have people who've been. Is it just me? Ah! <laughs> oh, no. Okay, I'm sorry. Hold on. Sorry. Have. 
Can you hear me now? No. No, it's my it's my network. Okay. Um, um maybe put something in the hold on. Sorry. Uh is it better now? No. Okay. It is One better second. now. Yeah, it is. Okay, so we have you back. I think yeah. I have a built-in IT <laughs> person, and he said he fix it. <laughs> I don't know. I ended up at home, so. Sometimes if you shut your video off, we can hear you better. <laughs> oh, that's true. <laughs> that was the answer. Yeah, hold on, let me try that. Oh, okay, how are we doing now? Better. This is not good. Uh, this is not good. Okay, I'm going to skip past you, Lexi. Give me something in the chat that people can read, and let me move on to ask Jason. Jason is also a home energy efficiency contractor. Jason, are you there? Yes. Okay. So can you tell us a little bit about energy management solutions and the common problems that you guys solve? Maybe tell us a little bit more about the home energy assessment in particular. Sure. Um, we started in 2008. Our main focus is home performance, and we really specialize in the home energy assessment side of it. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So we focus on the home performance and the home energy audit side of the, the equation. Um, what we do is we come out to your home, we learn about it with you, we show you different um, areas of the home, such as the attic, crawl spaces, different areas of the basement, and really try to teach you some things that maybe you weren't aware of as far as how the house is performing um, from an energy perspective. Um, what we do is we then compile those results and the findings. We prepare a nice clean audit report and we present you with those findings. So you have an idea of you know, how much potential energy savings you could achieve if you take on you know, certain energy efficiency measures. Now, the second side of our business is we focus on the insulation side of it. As, as AJ mentioned before, um, you know, really the first step to any kind of home um, performance um, improvement is to tighten the building shell. You know, you want to understand how the house is performing because you could put the most energy efficient system in your home. But if all that heat is escaping out the windows and the doors and up through the attic, it may as well be useless. You know, you have to make sure that you can contain the heat in the home first, and then you can size up for the most efficient unit for your possible, you know, for your home. So again, just as, as uh, Lauren mentioned before, we're a home performance contractor. We offer the no cost home energy assessments through New York State, and we're happy to schedule an appointment and, uh, you know, at your convenience to come out and teach you about the home. And any questions, I'm, I'm here to, to answer. Thanks, Jason. I think we'll bop around to the different technologies and we'll try to get- I have, a, I have a question for Jason. Oh, great. Uh, um, so we just purchased our home in September. So we haven't been in this house for very long. Um, it was, it's an old stone house built in 1920. Uh, the previous owners did a lot of renovations probably seven years ago, um, but we still feel like we definitely need a home energy um, audit. I'm just wondering if, um, do we, should we like be here for a certain amount of time before we do one of those audits in case you need, I don't know, some records and energy, like electricity bills going back a year or, or something like that, or? It's a great question. So, I mean, typically, you know, and now that we'll have about four to almost five months of usage, you know, that's enough to kind of get us started. And the software that we have takes into account really all the aspects of your home. So we use an energy modeling software and we're able to input things like, okay, you have exactly eight and a half inches of insulation in your attic spaces. You know, in your basement, if it's unfinished, you'll notice you probably have some fiberglass stuffed in around the rim joist section, kind of where the house, you know, where the actual home sits on top of the foundation. So, you know, we have all those different things into account. So to answer your question, no, I don't think it necessarily matters. Um, as far as how long you've been in the home, we have a lot of clients that, that, that purchase a, you know, their first home or a second home, um, and they're just trying to be comfortable and they want to understand how they can reduce their, their carbon output you know, and, and improve their carbon input. So 
Um, no, there's, there's, it's never too soon to get started. And we can always do a follow-up appointment, you know, eight months or nine months. And we can always just, you know, true up the records and look at your utility bills over a longer period as well. So it's not just, a, you know, here's your home energy assessment report, you know, have a great week. You know, we'll, we'll stay in, 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 in uh, communication as you kind of, you know, progress through your, your green journey, as we'll call it. We label it as a green action plan is, is how we put it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Shanti, for your question. Yeah. Okay, so I see some questions. Maybe my, let's see. So somebody must have asked about drilling on rock. Rob, I think maybe you responded. Yeah. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm really curious. We already have heat pumps in, in the house, and they, they work great. Uh, best thing I ever did. So if I wanted to retrofit them, with geothermal, maybe you can work uh, walk us through the process. I mean, how much of a mess it is? We have, uh, you know, we have mostly rock on our property with a little topsoil. It's an older house, and then we have a lot of trees and what I would, uh, you know, they'd be cutting down the trees to get the line in. You know, we have a lot of big trees with a lot of deep roots. Uh, walk us through the process a little bit of how that would work you know, construction wise, a truck pulls up and just digs sure. a hole and drops a pipe. <clears throat> the, the drilling for DX geothermal, which is copper and refrigerant, not plastic and polyglycol. We only drill 70 feet down into the ground on a 20 degree diagonal. So when you say that you have rock, it's not intuitive, but the more rock you have, the less expensive it is to drill. You can drill 70 feet into solid rock in about an hour. If you have any other substrate or sand or uh, cobbles or bank run or any other kind of soil, it takes two to three hours. So you actually save money. And when we look at the job site, it saves you about $500 per ton if you have solid rock. So walk me through it. You pull up with the truck, you measure it's not it out. You drill down 70 feet, uh, do you have to cut down trees or no, cut we, roots I, or in, how does in, in the work? 18, in, the, in the 16 years we've been doing this, we have never cut down a tree to install a system, not once. So we work very effectively, we mark trees, we move around. Our drill rig is 10 feet wide. It is a track rig, it's the same rig you see on the highway when you see them drilling for new construction. It's called a rock drill rig. So it comes onto your property with tracks. We pick out an area and the footprint for drilling DX is very, very small. One of the people on the call said they drilled four tons of water-based geothermal on the property. That would be drilled in a four to five foot diameter circle. And that's it, about 12 feet off the foundation wall of the house. So if you've got four to five feet worth of property, 12 feet off your foundation, that's the size of the area we would drill in, disturbing as little of the property as possible. And then you run a line, I guess, from the, the, the well or the drill to, to the house or to the... Um, yes. There's two manifolds. What? There's a liquid and vapor manifold that come from the ground. We, drill, we dig a trench to your house. We drill through your foundation wall normally into the basement, unless you prefer the units to be outside. The geothermal heat pumps can be outside and put in the same place as the condensers that you have. Or if you don't have central air, you can choose where you would like them to be. They do not have to be at the exact site where you drill. They can be up to 80 feet from that point of drilling. And these are uh, maintenance free, the well, the, the copper, the, the piping, what's yes. the maintenance involved? In it's buried underground free. and there is no maintenance. It's buried underground and it sustains. The only thing that contractors will put is a, is a protective anode to protect the copper for as long as it's in the ground. Okay. Copper um, comes from the ground, that's where it starts. It's taken out and we're putting it back in. So, Rob, I'm sorry, um, this is Shanti. So right now in our home, we have um, a cast iron oil fired boiler um, that um, heats up radiators. And then the previous owner 
took a couple of those stones so that he can install a hydro air system. Um, so we oh, have good. air and radiators. Um, but we're trying to figure out what to do with the oil, <laughs> the oil-based uh, boiler. So my, my options are gas, right? Either propane or natural gas, which we can't get here because it's a moratorium or geothermal. Is that correct? If you, if you have hydro, the, the, the fortunate thing is if you have hydro air in your home, a hydro air system is the same system as geothermal design. So if you have ductwork for a hydro air system, you already have 50% of the, of the project completed. Right. So that's a really good thing because hydro air, the, you're, you're going to take out the oil and eliminate it. You do not have to keep it if you don't want to have it. And if you do keep it, it would be your second stage heating source if your ductwork is not big enough to su support 100% of the geothermal uh, heating and cooling. The first thing that you do in an assessment of your heating and cooling system is to find out what your ductwork can support. Most people who have an existing home don't want to tear up their house to add more ductwork. Right. So what we frequently do is we put in a system that takes advantage of the exact size of the ductwork and go from there. Right. So I think the previous owners decided to keep the, the radiators because there are certain rooms that are on the perimeter of the house that tend to don't they don't really heat up as much as some of the central rooms. Understood. Rooms at the ends of the, the home. And so the radiators act as like auxiliary heat. Um, and we've been- If you know which rooms, if you know which rooms are the coolest, very often you'll put geothermal in for all of the rooms that are off your ductwork system. And then you would put ductless units, either the wall units or base units, which look like air cleaners. And then you take the oil out and you're off of oil. That's very, very common. That, the, the only issue is the, the ground floor is lit, like really, really thick stone walls. <laughs> um, Are they more than 20 inches thick? Probably. They could be, yeah. Okay. I would have to see it because we, we can core hole drill through a wall that's two feet thick. Okay. okay. And we so do I'm it gonna, I wonder if there's other people on the call that have such thick walls in their basement. I want to mention that there's two geothermal contractors on the line. We have two different approaches to geothermal and Rob is providing DX drilling and Dandelion is providing a closed loop geothermal system. Do you wanna talk a little bit about that, Corey? And then also I know there's some other questions coming in through the chat and we'll definitely get to those. Maybe well. tell us the differences between the two also, that would help. Yeah, maybe each Rob and Corey can tell us some differences and. Water-based water-based geothermal rely. Not saying anything bad about the no, other no, no. contractor. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I wasn't going to say. I was saying water-based <laughs> geothermal relies on heat exchangers. They they drill very deep into the ground. It's plastic and polyglycol, and there is a heat exchanger that, when the water circulates through the system, it transfers the temperature of the water to refrigerant in a heat exchanger. DX eliminates the water. There's no water in the system at all. It's done with refrigerant. The reason it's called DX is because it's direct exchange. So you have eliminated the pumps that pump the water and you eliminate the heat transfer required from a heat exchanger. So DX geothermal historically and through studies is about 18% more efficient than water-based geothermal but it's not always the best solution. It really depends on the house and the specific circumstances. Thanks, Rob. Corey, you wanna chime in? Sure, sure. Yeah, so, you know, Dandelion's been around um, for somewhere around four or five years. We're a spinoff of Google. Um, that's kind of where we got our start. We employ a, um, a ground loop system that is made of high density polyethylene. So it's kind of like PVC pipe, but it goes in to the ground and it's basically on a spool and it goes all the way down to the ground. It's one long 
continuous pipe with kind of a U-bend at the bottom. And we fill that pipe. Um, the depth of the well is really determined based on the heat load of the home. So every well is going to have a different depth, a uh, different number of holes that are going to need to be drilled. Um, the average home, 2,500 square feet, is going to have either one or two holes, uh, and it's going to be between 350 and 400 feet deep. Um, we do have proprietary drilling technology that allows us to drill really quickly, um, very efficiently. Um, the, the hole going in the ground is really only about five inches in diameter. We're filling the pipe with a combination of 78% water and 22% propylene glycol, which Funny story, I was uh, looking at the back of my probiotic gummies the other day, and sure enough, propylene glycol was, uh, was on the label. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's a non-toxic antifreeze. It's in a lot of the foods that we, that we cook with. Um, that's why a lot of folks um, you know, are, are, are happy with the water-sourced solution is because we don't have things like refrigerant in the ground um, and if something were to possibly happen and leak, um, it's a non-toxic um, solution. So, so that's, that's kind of what we do. We trench, we trench into the house. And I know that there was a question about rock ledge. Um, for us, uh, as, as, as Rob had mentioned, you know, we're drilling straight through um, and we're going pretty deep. We're, we're bound to hit, uh, you know, uh, bedrock at some point. And so drilling is not an issue. We can drill through pretty much anything. Trenching becomes a little bit more comp uh, complex when we have to rock chip to get from where we drill to the foundation. And so, um, you know, we want to keep the geothermal lines as much as we can below the frost line, which is represented by about four and a half feet. And, uh, and so we try to keep them as much below frost line as possible. And then we just bring those right into the, uh, into the foundation. Do these things ever leak at all, or have you had any leakage history? So one of the nice things either, about the line is we have, we pressurize, before we bury the lines, we pressurize them and we keep a pressure gauge on there just to make sure that, uh, that there is no leakage before we bury the lines. We bury the lines with the intent to never have to go back and dig them up. We also have uh, proprietary monitoring software on our equipment that allows us to measure the, the pressure in the lines and so forth. So if there ever is anything that happens, we have had one issue where actually we had a system installed and somebody had a deck put in and the contractor dug right into our geothermal line as it came into the house. That was unfortunate, um, but we, you know, we were able to identify and, and fix the solution pretty quickly. That's part of the reason also why we put in the high density polyethylene loops um, so when it's in the actual uh, borehole itself, it's really one continuous loop. So there's really not any real risk of anything leaking in the loop. It's really the one connection point or two connection points that we have before we bring it into the foundation. Let's stay on the geothermal questions and then let's have an answer from Dandelion and Geothermal Works. We had a question from Marianne. Do geothermal installations generate sufficient heat to support what square footage of a home? She's assuming these installations do not need to supplement with any other heating systems. And also, let me add on to that question. Can you guys talk about your approaches to houses if they have ductwork or if they don't have existing ductwork? So two-part question there. Sure, Rob, you want to, you can go sure. ahead. Sure, thanks. Um, I would just start with uh, my home's a great example. My house is 4,200 square feet. I do not have any form of cemental backup heat. And I have four separate systems in my house. Uh, I also have 40 panels on my roof and my entire house is air created, which is a non-expansion foam in the walls. And all the lights in my house, some of them you can see behind me are LED lights. <laughs> I think I took it to the extreme. Uh, Con, Ed still has, Con Ed still has a thumb on our heads. I mean, my bill in summer is $280 approximately. And in winter, it's probably five sixty, dollars somewhere around that. Um, we, we design homes to provide 100% of the heat requirement for the house. ASHRAE does not recommend that you do that, but we design it for 100%. Um, 
most of the homes that you look at with existing ductwork. Sometimes you have to, I don't know whose feedback. Is that my feedback? I don't think so. I think I'll just mute everybody. So then you have to just unmute yourself, okay? I'm gonna- Beautiful, that. thank you. So I, I, I would let you know that the ductwork in existing homes is very often a limiting factor because when ductwork first came into play and people designed their homes, the returns on R22 ductwork, which is the older refrigerant for air conditioning, sometimes the returns were too small. Upgrading and updating return ductwork is very simple and very easy to do. When you have an older home though, where all the ductwork is buried in the walls, most people do not wanna open up the walls of their house. If it's in an attic, easy to add supply. If it's in a basement, unfinished, easy to add ductwork. We very often do very, very large homes. Um, I would say in a large sense, we are not a competitor of Dandelion um, unless they've changed their strategy. Dandelion normally does homes five tons and less, and we normally do homes that are five tons and more, but uh, you're shaking your head, so maybe that's changed, I apologize. Um, we have done up to 22,000 square foot homes all the way down to 2,000 square foot homes. And regardless of the size, we look to do 100% of the heat of the house. Yeah, just, just, for, just for the record, um, uh, Daniel Lyon definitely does uh, larger homes. We, um, I actually personally just helped someone today move forward. They have a 10,000 square foot home. Oh, great. Uh, it does require uh, ductwork, 100%. And oftentimes, ductwork modifications are needed um, when we're accurately sizing a heating and cooling system to support uh, the heating demand of the home. But we are also able to cover 100% of the heat load of the home. And that's kind of a common misconception in the industry that I get a lot, uh, is that folks think that we need backup heating or some sort of fossil fuel backup for um, for geothermal because it just doesn't simply work in the Northeast and that is just categorically false. Um, we're able to support 100% of the load as well um, and each one of our systems are designed specifically for the heat load of the home. We're doing manual J uh, heating and cooling loads, load calculations. So it's a pretty thorough process but, uh, but rest assured uh, it, it works very, very well. Like I can attest to, um, there's this commercial building up in Boston, 19 story building, all geothermal, no backup. So you'll be fine. <laughs> um, I have a question. Um, does an assessment of your specific environment has to be done to ensure that there's a, enough temperature differential um, for the geothermal to work properly? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, that's that's something that Dandelion really prides itself on um, is the uh, the discovery phase, right? So um, we want to do a full heating and cooling engineering analysis of the house before anything is set in stone, uh, which is going to require us, as we learned earlier, to assess insulation levels. And if you can get an energy audit done first, that works so much better because we have so much additional data that we can design to to make sure that this system is designed specifically for your home. But it does- I'm, I'm referring more to like the, the environment outside. So the soil- Oh. Um, you know, Westchester, Westchester, Westchester County soil is 52 degrees, pretty much regardless of where you are in Westchester County. So yeah. the region is a band, the way they were defined originally about 20 years ago, when they put the bands out for weather and topography. So the topography, the only area in Westchester County that has issue is Briarcliff. Because Briarcliff is the only town I know of that had bank run that actually resulted in quartz. And as Corey may or may not know it, I would assume anyone drilling into quartz has a problem. Your drill rig will not work. So in 16 years, we've only hit it once. We still installed the system on the property because we moved to another area. But besides quartz, and, and I think one area specifically in Croton on the Hudson where they have clay, those are the only two regions that you could possibly have a, a negative consequence without knowing your topography. This is Lexi with Healthy Home and I'm hoping my internet is working now. Yeah, it is beautifully. 
I moved stations and I've taken over my husband's computer, but to actually go off of what Corey said, um, and Shanti, this does apply to what you said, but also doesn't, but we work with Dandelion in the past and I'm sure Jason over at AMS will agree, but having an evaluation done first is really helpful because I've actually had customers who work with Dandelion and then Dandelion says, we can do your system only if you do a certain amount of air leakage reduction in the home. And both Jason and I, I'm sure, are on the same page that we'd love to help with that. And we just want to keep people's projects moving along. But having a blower door number and knowing where your home's air leakage is at and how, how large that load is for the geothermal system and getting that load down first is, is a good step just to make their jobs easier because you don't want to work backwards. And I'm sure that Corey and Rob would agree that we don't, they want to oversize the system. Right. They want to size it appropriately. They don't want to put a system in and then all of a sudden two years later, you uh, insulate your attic or reduce your home's air leakage by a massive amount, which can have a pretty large impact on the overall system performance. So we want to make sure that those steps are taken appropriately. And I'm, and I'm sure Jason working with Dandelion and we worked with them in, on past campaigns and it's great and smooth and awesome. And, Jason and I would probably would love to make sure that that goes smoothly for everyone in those handoffs and keeping everything, everyone on the same page. Yeah, and, and, and just to piggyback on that too, um, you know, I think it's not that necessarily that Dandelion wouldn't have done that project. It's that it becomes economically uh, unfeasible yeah. to yeah. install multiple heat pumps when if you were to add insulation and air seal and, and make some energy efficiency improvements, yeah we can really drive down that cost and make it a lot more economically beneficial. Yeah, and we, we've had that experience and I, I apologize for the, the wording of it, but yeah, like in terms of the customers who have called us, they say, you know, Dandelion said we should talk to you and it's, it's kind of worked really well. And we always want to make sure that we get that timeline and Jason and I want to make sure we can meet the timelines for everyone um, and just kind of keeping everything moving along and keeping everyone good. Good. Now we only have a couple minutes left before it's 8.30. So I want to have Lexi talk a little bit more. We haven't really talked about heat pumps, air source heat pumps much. So geothermal is a good solution. If you have existing ducts, you're looking to expand your ducts or install duct work, right? So if your house is not going to go for that at all, you should be looking at an air source heat pump. And Lexi, can you give us a little bit of information about air source heat pumps? And also there was a question from Janice. She wants to know how does the heat pump clean or purify the air? Yeah, so in terms of who we are and what we do, Healthy Home takes like the whole house approach. We do a whole home evaluation first and actually part of our evaluation does include indoor air quality sampling. So we have a baseline of that. In terms of, and just air source heat pumps specifically, when we're looking at a home, we want to first evaluate the load. So how much energy you're using to condition the home in the current state it's in, and then utilizing energy modeling software, like Jason mentioned before, to evaluate that load and implement a solution. Now, as we're doing that, if people are thinking, hmm, my boiler might be reaching its end of life or furnace might be reaching its end of life, and you're thinking about getting prepared for a new system, we're going to keep that in mind. Air source heat pumps can, like Ajay mentioned before, utilize existing ductwork. So if you do already have, say, maybe just central air, we can evaluate that. And also it allows us to, if there's basement areas or things like that, we can core drill through basement walls and install like those little ductless heads. If anyone's ever been in a really small restaurant, you sometimes notice these on the wall where they're large, re or not large, but they're rectangles that are on the walls. There's also other units that are like you can have on the floor and things like that. But essentially they're all electric heat pumps um, that allow us to both do heating and cooling to extremely low temperatures. Uh, similar to what for geothermal, we always want to evaluate that the load on the home first, just so they're sized appropriately. Um, but if you aren't a good candidate for geothermal, which can happen for whatever myriad of technological reasons that I don't have, um, but you do want to go all electric, there is still an option. We can utilize ductwork. We can utilize various units depending on the aesthetics of the home. It's something we want to be very conscious of always, particularly when working in like Austin and Briar Clubs are some really beautiful older homes and you want to keep a certain aesthetic to your home. So that's, there are other options and without having to possibly install ducts or tear anything down, just kind of keeping that there. I don't have a great example of explaining the technology. I think I'd leave that to Ajay if there's any more technological questions. Um, but in terms of options, there is an option to get off of oil or any sort of fossil fuel that isn't just geothermal. Air source heat pumps are an option. And I'll just hammer it home to always evaluate the load first and foremost. And I always think evaluate the load. <laughs> you always want to look at your load. You just want to see how much energy you're using and what can be done there. Reduce before you produce. You want to get your 
and your carbon footprint as low as possible and utilizing the things that Susie has in place with Crone 100 and that carbon tracker is awesome. And you want to get that load as low as possible and then take those next steps of what can I do to, to change the situation I'm in to make it even lower and take that next step down. And as far as the cost for a healthy home, homeowner's yeah. assessments? So Healthy Homes Evaluation does have a copay associated with it. There is a free New York State audits. I believe EMS's is, is no cost. Um, our testing is a little more intensive than what is required by the state. As I mentioned earlier, we do indoor air quality testing. And I apologize, I missed that aspect of the question in terms of the air source heat pumps. Um, the air source heat pumps do have filtration in them. Um, I can't go into the exact technology. I'm the office manager. I don't sell anything. You know. So I don't know <laughs> that much about it, but we can definitely assist you when it comes to it. helps. We There's filtration and things like that. And again, being cognizant for indoor air quality concerns, knowing where the air leakage is coming from and being able to control that fresh air is really, really important. So for the third time, load reduction. You want to evaluate how much energy you're using, where that air leakage is coming from, minimize it from coming from the places you don't want it to, like around your windows and doors, and be able to really control it and then have it run through filters like through an air source heat pump, which is an option. Um, but our evaluation does have a fee associated with it. Our copay, um, we do credit the value of the free audit from the state, but our copay is 250 plus tax, which we do credit back to people if they choose to move forward with any aspect of your solution. If you have any questions on want more detail on why we have a copay, you can give me a call right at the office and I'd be happy to kind of walk you through our step-by-step -step on why we do have an additional fee associated with it. Okay, good. So there's a few more questions. Um, I'm trying to think, was there anything else for air source? Okay, here's the next questions. Gina has a good question. They don't have a basement. They are above ground on a slab. Is there an issue needing to be four inches before below ground for piping? That's a geothermal question. It might have been, was that answered? No. Corey or Rob, do you want to talk about drilling? How, where it is outside the house? 12 feet off the foundation wall, you do not need to have a basement. Uh, most systems that you add, there is a closet or a utility room in existing homes. We can utilize the space in the existing utility room and the units, the actual geothermal heat pumps can be placed outside. Our geothermal heat pumps cannot be placed outside. Ours must be located inside of, a, um, of either a basement or a finished space. Um, or if it's in a garage, we would just need them to be in an enclosure. But no, slab is not a immediate disqualification at all. Um, we could bring the geothermal lines directly to the foundation and bring them up right into uh, wherever, uh, whatever room we need to get into. Okay, good to know. Now, I know probably most of the people on the call have a hot water radiator situation going on. And it's kind of hard to say what is the right solution for that. So right now we are offering geothermal air source heat pump. Neither has a perfect allocation to the technologies. Rob, are you wanting to talk about your product? Say that again, I'm sorry. Do you want to talk about your radiate, your, or not now? Your geothermal I, I, plan I'm for sorry. radiators. <laughs> Sorry. We don't we act, we actually geothermal is not hot enough to do radiators. What about your new technology? I that 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 gives you the ability to install ductless geothermal, oh. but it is not it is not hot enough to do radiators. There is right. a man there, there is there is a manufacturer who is producing equipment. It's not complete yet, but their goal is to get to the point where they can add ductless geothermal off of the DX geothermal system. Um, for anyone on the call that's interested in finding out without talking to people and just getting a rough idea of what the geothermal pricing is or what it would cost you, there now is a geothermal calculator on our site and you can go to that site and look at it. It asks you three simple questions. How many square feet is your house? How many square feet is your basement? And do you or do you not have ductwork and it will tell you within a couple thousand dollars what the cost will be. And yes. it's live. Oh, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so, so Corey and Rob, this is Scott Smith and I sort of 
Geothermal is a pretty good fit for radiant floor heating though, right? Not radiators, but radiant floor. I think there are certainly applications and, um, and uh, equipment that works with radiant flooring. Dandelion currently does not uh, provide a solution for radiant flooring. Our systems work 100% through forced air vents. DX does provide you with radiant heat. There's usually a unique tank. Most geothermal systems have in the inner workings of the product, something called a three-way valve. So your system is either heating, cooling, or making hot water. For whatever reason, the industry's design of those three-way well, three valves historically last about four years. If you have a dedicated law, uh, system making hot water, it can last 15 to 20 years with no issue. So if you're going to do radiant geothermal, my only advice is to designate that system specifically for radiant. Don't do heating, cooling, forced air, and radiant. Have a radiant-only system added to your design. If anyone's interested, we actually have radiant uh, floor geothermal at Healthy Homes headquarters. Um, so it's Beautiful. kind of interesting to say, yeah. It's very hey, Rob, is it true that uh, with that sort of heating as well, um, it, it would require a manual change um, if you wanted no. to switch from heating to cooling or no? Mm -mm. No, it does not. Okay. Cool. It does not. Can you put the, um, the uh, calculator, the geothermal calculator link in the chat? Yep, I can do that right now. Oh, sure. Thank you. I'll do that. Right. Okay. Are there um, any oh, last I, questions I, out there? Susie, do you, still, do you feel like your question has not been answered? I, I think that's an important one. I want to make sure we get an answer to it. So Susie's question, okay, yeah. Do you want me to ask it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, my situation is I have a home that was built in 1927. I don't know how thick the cement walls are, but they're fairly thick. It's it's similar to uh, Shanti, I think it was, that was asking the question. Yes. Um, I, have, um, I have solar, I have insulation. I've been through both programs with Sustainable Westchester. Um, but I have radiators um, from uh, using natural gas on my first floor and my second floor is, is um, duct work. So I don't really need help with the, with the electricity on the second floor. It's all the first floor and that is all thick cement. So is your question whether geothermal will work uh, for your specific home? If I learned anything tonight, it sounds like no, <laughs> it wouldn't. So I think without, without a, a pretty decent amount of, of ductwork modifications uh, to the house, it would be it would be difficult for geothermal to be a good fit for your home, at least with dandelion. Right, and then with air source with mini splits or anything like that, that's still a lot of drilling through cement and then closing up radiators. So that's another thing to think about, right? Mm -hmm. The radiators all over the first floor. Like yeah, in terms of the radiators, um, yeah, like when it comes to removing those or getting rid of those, that is just in, in, in and of itself a large construction thing. Now, here's the, the other interesting thing about the New York State incentives for air source heat pumps is that if your system is sized to the full load of your house, you can still access a New York State incentive without actually having to remove those radiators. The state does not require you fully remove the old system, particularly because that does incur a lot of just fee, like just pricing in general. But as long as the air source heat pump system is sized to do the appropriate amount of heating and cooling load, you are completely eligible for the incentives for the full load heating and cooling. And then people do, it's not uncommon for people just to leave the boiler with the assumption that they're never going to use it. Um, and then you're just not, you're not burning fuel anymore with the hope for the future plans of getting rid of it entirely, but it is a lot of construction. And again, as aesthetics is important and depending when you pull that out, think about what sheetrock under it's going to look like. It is a big project, but you are still definitely eligible for air source heat pump incentives as long as it's designed to fully handle your load. So that might be a good route for you. Um, because it, it is, it will be a lot of drilling through the cement, but it's possible with a core drill. I think Scott wants to yeah, add Yeah, your something. walls aren't two feet thick. <laughs> Do you this, your walls aren't two feet thick and you can come up through the basement. 
Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure there's much else to add except that there's no, just to be super clear, with air source heat pumps, there's no vertical drilling like, uh, you know, Corey and others were talking about. So um, putting mini splits in, in either a part of a home or a full home that has existing steam radiators is, is, is doable. There's no, there's no. And you can utilize the ductwork upstairs and then install ductless heads downstairs, which is nice. Again, depending, obviously you need to lay out condenser, condensing units where those would go, but like Scott is saying, it's totally doable and we could utilize the existing ductwork upstairs and you'd still get to condition downstairs with ductless. Exactly. Thanks. I have one last question. I don't, um... Rob, you get the last question. <laughs> So, so you're drilling down 70 feet, and this is for either one of you guys, and you're not are you drilling down totally vertical, or is there a horizontal slant? I think somebody mentioned 20%. What Indeed. happens when that drilling crosses property lines? The, when you drill, I, I mean, it's the only time I remember that my, uh, my math from high school made sense. We look at the uh, tangent lines, et cetera. We're, 20 degree, we're 12 feet off the foundation wall and we're drilling on a 20 to 30 degree diagonal, depending on how close we are to other properties. Uh, the only municipality I know of that doesn't care if you drill into another property is Rye. <laughs> Rye does not care as long as they don't see the lines. I thought that's a little <laughs> odd, but, but Corey, take that to heart. They don't care. Um, the so, reason- So in other words, in, in the village, the houses, uh, in, in a lot of the village, the houses are really close together. Uh, so in theory, you'll drill right under somebody else's house. That seems like it would become an issue. We would drill vertically if we were that close. The size of the drilling space from, from five feet would go, believe it or not, to 22 feet diameter circle if we couldn't go to someone else's property. Yeah. So there's, there's also there's also setbacks, right? So correct. And I believe DX has the same setbacks as as vertical drilling. We need to stay, stay ten feet off of the property line. Um, you know, twenty five feet away from a well, fifty feet away from a septic tank and or leach field. Um, and we try to stay between twelve and fifteen feet away from the foundation of the house. Or at least we do. Same. Um, but yeah, but you know, drilling we drill just straight vertically down. And if the house has a little bit of a slope. Our drill rigs have the ability to levelize so that we are drilling straight down into the ground. Okay. Okay. Um, any last questions? Home energy efficiency, air source heat pump. It certainly seems like there's lots of exploration to do. You may want to meet with a few contractors. Feel free to give us a call at the office. Options galore. But I also was really happy to see in the chat a lot of people on the call have implemented these technologies in their home. So Katie, Emily, Rob, pretty awesome. Bravo, you're leaders in our community. And we just wanna say thanks so much for joining us tonight. If there's any last questions, I'll keep the Zoom open and feel free to ask, but otherwise I'm sure people wanna go to sleep or you know, get cozy. So hey, Lauren. Maybe, yeah. Mm -hmm. Quick question just for everybody who's on the call. So, so this campaign isn't forever. Um, can you tell everybody how long the campaign is going to last and how many other sessions we may have, what they might look like? Oh, good points. Yeah. So the campaign in Austin and Briarcliff will go until the end of April. So we'll be doing probably like four more of these Zooms. If it's possible to get outside in April or something, we would love to see you all in person and do something outside. And we've got 24-7 phone help and even after the campaign perhaps isn't putting banners all around town, we'll still be around helping Westchester homeowners with this work until the end of 2022. And Lauren, it's Dana. Yeah. Um, just for those people who might not have copied things down from the chat or, you know, I know that we are recording this and it, I assume it'll be available on uh, the Sustainable Westchester site and we can all link to it. But also, is it possible that from the registration list that you can send out the contact information for the contractors and some of the information that you shared in the chat to all the people who registered? 
Definitely. Uh, yep. I'm going to send an email with the link to the, or the video of the recording. That's perfect. I'll include the contractor info, some links to the website. And also the good news is I think we had at the height of this 65 people on the line. Oh. We, plant, we planted 65 trees tonight. So, oh. okay. Anything Lauren, else? Thank you for everything that you do. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks all for <laughs> being here. Okay. Until we meet again. <laughs> Good night, Good everyone. Morning, everyone. Take care, folks. Okay. Bye. 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 Thank you.